What'll I do now? This here broken bridge speaks to me some. A fair place to rest me old bones for a bit. And tell you what, with all this sunlight and fresh air, I can feel the calling forth of the poetic muse beneath me trousers. Been a long time since I felt this here compass point in any direction. Now, speaking of navigations and the like, a long time ago, I had me a nice collection of riches stuffed away in a lockbox. Being the stupid ass that I am, I buried the thing one eve when I was high in my cups. Can't for the death of me remember where I... Except I knew it was near this broken bridge. The box has a silver locket in it. It holds the portrait of my late wife, Meredith. It's the last thing I have in this world to remember her by. If you happen across my lockbox in your travels, I'd be appreciating of its return. It's a bit of an embarrassing affair, truth be told. Thought I could return to the golden days, you know. Be a terror of the high seas like in me youth. <laughs> Problem was, they'd all forgotten me. Those young blighters sailing about, they had no clue who I even were. Figured if I could complete another great feat, like slaying that sea bitch Mervale, maybe that had earned me my respect back. <sighs> Suppose I don't need to tell you. That girl is stronger than she looks. All it took were one slip of the old hands, and next I knew the black crest was wrecked against the coast, and I'm getting myself eaten alive by that hag. Peeled each separate muscle from my bones, she did. I tell you, it weren't pretty. I... I know Lily be missing me something great, and it cuts me deep not to go visit the lass. Thing is, I reckon she should remember me as I was. Not wretch at the sight of the spectre I be now. Let the legend live on in her mind, I say. Think of the worst place ye can imagine. That's Pondium. Now think of the gods be damned best whorehouse you've ever had the pleasure of. <laughs> That's Pondium. A pirate paradise full of bodies to stab, holes to fill, and devious liquor to imbibe. Brine rots control the whole island and make sure it lives up to the lowest of expectations. Can't imagine much has changed since I was there last. Still, it's a good place to swash your buckle and make love to a bawdy, buxom bunter out back of a boozy bar. Aye, them brine rods be a nasty bunch. Led by me very own flesh and blood, me baby sister Lucy. The rod mother, they call her now. Used to be that I were their leader, back when the brine rots were about one thing, and one thing only, raiding, pillaging, and plundering their scrawny black guts out. Old Lucy were me first mate for years, but she got a whiff of the power that being captain could gain her, and mutineered me, me own sister. Drop me on some deserted island of the coast of somewhere. The bitch took months to make it back to the mainland. That brine rod clan's been trouble ever since. Used to have some good old-fashioned pirate on them. And now, they're raving mad lunatics out for their next fix of fear and fortune. Judging by that rather curious ship and its aberrant captain, I imagine you had rather an interesting voyage here. Now, Inquisitor Maligaro. We must have a soul. He has most certainly returned to his old haunt, yet his manifestations are like wisps on the wind. They are one moment, gone the next. While I am familiar with the phantasmal trails and tributaries that filigree this reality, Maligaro's exact whereabouts eludes me. You should speak with these desperates who cling to this broken bridge, that young Templar scholar in particular, their mundane knowledge must provide where my enlightened sapiens cannot. There was a time before the beast, bathed in the shadows of lost memory, 
when men and women like you could ascend. Through rareness of quality and the adoration of their people, these few could reach out into the quickening mists of immortality and grasp the power of godhood. Mind you, transcendence is never easy. Like the pains of childbirth, it reeks of agony, tragedy, and sacrifice. The sacrifice most often being of one's humanity. That is simply the way of it. Those of us who seek the immortal throne live long enough to see ourselves become truly monstrous. Ah, yes. You do seem to have a penchant for presenting yourself when times are at their most uh, perplexing. It would seem that our Almighty has forsaken us. False deities from ages past now rise and ravage while our blessed innocence remains as silent as the stones at my feet. So much for Templar propaganda, eh? Well, I suppose if we are to fend for ourselves, then I should answer your troubling arrival with our own most pressing tribulation. The relic that washed ashore and started all the chaos. It was covered in ancient vowel inscriptions. The symbols were much weathered, making them challenging to translate. Yet I did my best. The inscriptions spoke of the god Ralakesh. If this object somehow housed the spirit of that many-faced monstrosity, then I fear we are all in danger. Ralakesh was renowned for his penchant for subjugation and control. Please, I urge you to destroy this god before his strength and dominance grow insurmountable. Nip this divine threat in the bud, as it were. Our poor friend, Grust, has likely become Ralikesh's avatar in this world. At least his recent behavior would indicate as much. If you could see to Grust's passing, Ralikesh will be forced to retreat into the relic. Destroy the relic, and perhaps you will also destroy the god. Yes, Ralikesh, the god of many faces. I read about this god when I looked after the museum in Theopolis. It said he was obsessed with governance, in particular the control of humanity through our base animal instincts. He ruled over the citizens of one unfortunate Val city. Alas, the name escapes me. Yet I do recall that his experiments brought his subjects to the brink of extinction, and that he was forced to enslave many a primitive Asmerian of the time so as to repopulate his domain. Though I shudder at the thought, I can only imagine that Ralikesh has rather similar plans now. It started with a few mumblings in his slumber, then long forays into the wilds, searching for relics of a distinctly arachnid nature. I thought it a natural extension of Silk's eccentric persona at first. Then came the sleepless nights studying those relics, the fevered recitations in broken varlish, the strange eight-phase rituals. Then one night Silk gathered his collection and scuttled off into the darkness without a word. Silk has always been susceptible to fine fictions. Perhaps he has finally shunned reality altogether. A fascinating case that flies in the face of all that is natural. Whalem is undead for sure. Something we have in spades in Rayclast, but a sentient, reasonable ghost? Now that is rare indeed. When we talk, I feel as if I'm staring into the breach, witnessing that which man was not meant to know. I have theorized about what animates the pirate's essence, how he manages to manifest on this earth once again. I think I shall compile my observations and speculations into a book. Yes, Eremir's Elucidations of Undeath. 
has a nice ring to it, don't you think? You arrive. The great spirit spoke in my dreams, told me that darkness would again drown our lands, and you, exile, would walk before the flood. But what is this? You are not alone. A shade, a memory, older even than... No, older than spirit? Fear grips my throat, I shake, but the spirit drapes a warming cloak upon my shoulders. This ancient ghost that follows you, it has the trust of the spirit, and if the spirit trusts, then I trust. My heart weeps for our old home, but what the spirit gives, we must embrace. The spirit, it claims who it needs to, when it needs to. There is no sense in sadness. I watch Silk for many days, scurrying to this old Val stone, scurrying to that old Val ruin, always muttering. He talked and talked and talked, yet I heard no one answer. The spirit warned that I should stay away from him. It pained me. Silk is my friend, yet I must listen to spirit. I go from Silk's side, and now he is gone from mine. I do not know where Silk go. But I see him in dreams. He is caught in great spider web that stretch into darkness. And that spider web? It is full of bones. More bones from more people than I ever see in my life. If you find Silk, please free him from the web. Don't let him become bones like the rest. Rayclast has changed. Once, I knew my place in this world. I knew my place within the spirit. Now, doorways have opened. Doorways I can neither see nor touch, but through which the spiritless ones pass all the same. The spiritless ones must be driven back. Their doors must be closed. May the great spirit guide you in your battles against these ancients that mean us nothing but ill. I belong to no one but the spirit. I have no need for the sweet words and caresses of a ghost. Waylam, he makes me laugh, and he hears the voice of the spirit, not in the same way I do. His spirit speaks of the great waters beyond this land. He pays heed to the spirit, and the spirit loves him for it. I do not. It is better to speak to the dead than no one at all. Waylam knows the spirit, but he will not know me. Turn your back for the barest moment and Rayclast bites you in the proverbial. I imagine that's how you're feeling upon visiting us this time. It's how I feel about now. I'm afraid that the Inquisitor's spirit has indeed returned to the Chamber of Sins. Yet while you won't encounter Melagaro by wandering his halls, I do perhaps know how you can find him. Whilst investigating the Fell Shrine, I learned of the existence of a map forged by Melagaro from his own viscera. This map allowed him to transfer his spirit into another form of existence, an existential safe house to which he could retreat should death ever attempt to take him. Understanding the map's purpose, Vol tried to destroy it, to no avail. So he locked it away deep within the ruins of Frisia Cathedral. Find that map and place it upon the reverie device in Melagaro's old laboratory. And when you step over that threshold, expect the very worst. Don't get me wrong, I've witnessed many unsettling things in my lifetime, but a spectral corsair living next door to me? We reside in dark times indeed when the living need share their quarters with the dead. I didn't think it possible for Silk to grow any more peculiar, but then I've been wrong about so many things since coming to Rayclast that I shouldn't have been at all surprised. Still, it's interesting that his behavior of late has mirrored that of certain Templar zealots I had the dubious pleasure of meeting back in Theopolis. Like them, Silk appeared obsessed with finding answers to this reality in some ethereal realm of divinity. For my part, I prefer to keep faith in this world. The answers that come from beyond are seldom the ones we want. My poor Grust, a kind man, a strong man, and now, I begged him not to meddle with that relic. It washed ashore after the earthquake and Groost simply had to know whether it was a danger to us, to me. The unholy thing within that device, 
It possessed Grust, turned him into a monstrosity. We fled the village, and as I turned back, I saw he was killing them. The stragglers, killing them all, even the children. My Grust is dead. That thing that has stolen his body. Please, destroy it. I'm aware that you and Grust had something of a commercial relationship prior to his... accident. As is the Asmeri custom, Grust's few possessions have now passed to me. I'm by no means the warrior he was, yet I know my blades and bows well enough. At least it's something I can do to honor his memory, and to keep my mind off things. Ina's a pretty young thing, ain't she? Bosoms to eclipse the sun she has. Eh. Might be that I spent some time here. Get to know the lass a tad more. Never mind that she's young and alive and I be... Um, old and dead. Once she hears me poetry, that is. Not a girly alive who won't want for a bit of the old rot tooth once he breaks out the uh, tongue twisters and word plays. <laughs> Not that she'd likely hold much interest in an old ghost like me. Still, a man can dream, even a dead one. Ah, that lassie. Pretty on the eyes, I reckon. But she's got her knickers pulled up far too high. Bit uptight, if you ask me. Eremir, though he's a tad dull, tends to ramble on a bit. Still... He's a few interesting stories of his own, so might be worth chewing the fat with from time to time. Let us go hunting, this time amongst the ruins of an encampment most familiar to you, once inhabited by your friends, the Asmeri. Hmm, Ralakish. He's ruthless and cruel with cunning unfathomable, yet he bears one defining weakness, a fear he forged into chains of his own keeping. His is the terror of grasping too much and having it all slip through his fingers. It makes him irrational and therefore vulnerable. Ralakesh, the illustrious master of a million faces. I call him the god of hide and seek. While other deities waged wars, spread their seed, and laid waste to whole empires, Ralakesh perched on his throne in a dark palace of ebony, choked with incense, blinded by obedience, and deafened by a senseless cacophony of brass gongs. Thankfully, he never had the courage to peek over the high walls he built, else the world might have been in trouble. Thank the gods. You're no saint, I can see that. Though, who am I to question what form divine providence comes in? I am the great Alva Valai, reliquarian extraordinaire. A seeker of mysteries, explorer of the unknown, lover of all things that glitter, and I need your help. The lost temple of Atsuatl. Halls lined with finery, boxes stuffed with glimmering riches and relics touched by insurmountable power. The eons lost to him. I believe the secret of its location lies in the Val City, which until very recently was submerged and completely unreachable. But with all that's going on, the city has risen from the depths and, well, it's still completely unreachable. It seems the only way to even get close is across the river, and the only crossing is overrun with bandits. I have a plan that could make both of us unbelievably wealthy, but... Perhaps one day. Me look it! <laughs> oh, me darling. Me beautiful Meredith. How I miss your shuddering bosoms, your quivering thighs. <gasps> She had a heart to melt an iceberg, and teeth the size of a... Ooh. Well, anyway, I, I thank you greatly. Please, whatever else be in that lockbox, take your pick from it. This locket be the only treasure I need.
touching this makes me feel quite strange. I imagine it was no easy feat, removing that abomination from its tomb. The horrors that must still lurk beneath the Fell Shrine. Well, I suppose you'll be meeting abominations aplenty where you're going next. Place that map upon Malagaro's reverie device, and remember, hope for the worst. At least then you'll be partially prepared for what's to come. We have woven a tale together in days past. Perhaps we shall again. We make mighty stories, you and I. And now I have daunting task before me. The last in my great journey. Near to us, cast in shadow, a monster awaits. Black Death is his name. A beauteous eight-leg, twisted grotesque by the master of these loathsome halls. I wish to give this eight-leg the merciful peace he deserves, and to save what is still beautiful, the elixir that only Black Death can make. Please, will you find him? Kill this Black Death. Take the Eight Legs Venom for me. I may be fearsome warrior, but Black Death's master has made him into a thing more monstrous than even I can best. Who knows? Perhaps Black Death is too strong even for you. I have climbed the great Eight Leg Web. I know the Eight Legs like no other. This eight leg, this Black Death, is one of the oldest and most fearsome eight legs in all this land and beyond. To its shame, it was made pet, plaything by the malicious master of this place. For years countless, it grew in pain. Pain is all it knows, all it can understand, all it can give. End Black Death's pain for all and once. My great journey led me to places of great power beyond even your stories, great dreamer. I am carried on legs and webs and shadows. That is all you can know for now. Where am I? Two for me, artist, but who's counting? Our brutal construction nears completion, and now only the wretched Dodri Darktum remains. Unlike her compeers, who, in undeath, have yearned for the familiar, Dodri appears drawn to the old wounds of calamity. The cataclysm took some and left much that a parasite like Dodri might enjoy. I shall meet you in San, where I hope you shall make swift and bloody work of that foul hag. The Black Venom. Oh, great dreamer who has done great deeds. I shall see to it that my queen rewards you with honor and mercy when she rises up to claim what is hers. Yes. This elixir, so aged and potent, shall be life-giving draught that she sips upon first waking. It is my gift to her, my wedding gift. Great dreamer, 
You will be wrapped in silken finery and made welcome at our wedding feast. Guest of honor. And oh, what a feast we all shall enjoy. What? He's intending to make matrimony with Arakali? My word, that's quite a story even for Silk. Yes, I know that name, and the place to which it is purportedly attached. A temple to the north, now in ruins. If Silk intends unholy congress with this Arakali, that is the most likely place we would seek it. Unfortunately, Arakali's temple lies beyond that which now belongs to Rarakesh. To reach the many-legged goddess, you must first draw to some conclusion with the many-faced god. From what I can recall, Arakali was a vile fertility goddess, a rather unsettling union of sexuality and mortality. Whilst usually presenting herself as a large arachnid, Arakali would often assume human form, a ruse intended to lure mortals into the act of copulation. The entries were vague about the gender of her prey. After satiating her carnal desires, she would then quench her divine thirst, draining her erstwhile lover of all bodily fluid. Her acolytes would then collect the desiccated husk and give it a decorative placement in Arakali's unholy temple. I fear that Silk knows not the true nature of the marriage he so desperately seeks. What you tell me of Silk, this I understand, though I do not want to. I have spent many nights pondering Silk's journey, why he has stepped from the spirit path, now I know. He has walked into the eight arms of blind lust, Arakali. Silk is a warning to us all. He is trying to take the short trail to greatness, to the story Spirit has made for him. Silk tries to steal his story, but now he holds only a lie. Please, you must find the place where this Arakali sleeps in her web of shadow. You must stop Silk before he wakes her. A mistake that we all will come to regret. The spirit tells me this is so. I have asked questions of spirit, and it has answered in dreams that wake me with screaming. Arakali will suck all life from this land, leave only empty husks and dusty bones. There will be no spirit, no us, no thing left to love and laugh. Only husks and dust and... Arakali. One less twisted intellect perverting our world. There is still much to be done, but at least we can rest easier in the knowledge that Melagaro and his foul creations will trouble Rayclass no longer. Here. I know that you and Groost didn't see eye to eye, but I'm sure he would have wanted to recognize this deed. It's the act of a warrior, after all. A temptress and a predator. Vile legends say she crawled up from the blackest of pits during the creation of the world. No, her beginnings were far more mundane. A mortal harlot whose endless lust for loin and lecherous delight saw her transformed into the very image of her dark desires. The Spinner of Shadows, they once called her. She sees herself as a regular goddess of love and has the romantically forged temple to prove it. That's where you'll find her. Yet there's little romance to the lady herself. At least, I doubt the corpses that now embrace her carapace would think so. Answering the call of a royal invitation, I visited the Spinner of Shadows as an emissary for a small and fragile alliance of gods. Mostly weak deities huddling together in terror of being consumed by their greaters. At this time, Queen Arakali ruled an empire, and so invited me to gaze upon her mighty works with appropriate wonder. If I'd looked past this pretense, I may have chanced to see her hidden desire to have me share her bed. For years, I lay trapped in her webbed sheets. Some days, she enjoyed my prowess. Other days, we enjoyed each other. Yet, this illusion of love and leisure simply veiled the morbid reality that I was not free to leave. 
I languished under her bewitching spell until the day the spider was betrayed by her own flies and sealed within that temple of her own fevered making. the tyrant's face and kingdom end without a trace when you try to control everything you ultimately control nothing Rolakesh has never quite been able to grasp that concept yes I thank you though I loved him I know Grust was lost to me the very moment he touched that vile abomination I will weep over his passing for many more nights to come but I am happy that you avenged his honor and freed him from his torment. There's an Asmeri shrine tucked away in the northern forest. Grust took me there, told me it was a memorial to those who had gone before him, a place where their spirits could rest. When he passed, he wanted his remains to be laid to rest with the bones of his people. His body, I find it difficult to even think about it, but I doubt it will ever be recovered. Yet there might still be a way. He gave me his necklace, the fangs he earned when he rose from boyhood to manhood, handed it to me for safekeeping only moments before... before Rella Kish. It's almost as if he knew what was to come. Please, could you deliver this necklace to the shrine for me? Put Grust's spirit to rest? I would do it myself, but the journey to the northern forest is not what it was. These lands have changed, and not for the better. Grust hunted too far from the lands of spirit and fell prey to a spiritless one. I am sad at how he passed, an ugly death. Yet I am thankful that he suffers no more, that he has now found his way back to the spirit, that he can rest now. You truly are a hero of the modern age, succeeding where even the ancient Val could not. I must say I'm really quite relieved. For a while there, I feared we were headed towards another theocratic dictatorship. Exile allowed me to be free of one. I had no wish to experience another. You deserve to be rewarded for your efforts. Here, something with a little insight would suit your purposes nicely. Into the most dreaded of thickets you must go, I'm afraid. For there, Grothkull, the despairing, sulks and schemes. The Val laid waste to her kingdom and placed her slaughtered children at her feet. Grief enveloped Grathkull, transformed her, flooded her mind with a singular thought, to share her suffering with those who had murdered her daughters. Though she has returned, her sanity has not. There is no fury like a mother bereaved. I wonder if Grathkull would still grieve for her children if she knew the truth. The Spinner of Shadows had no aspirations until Grathkull's daughters plotted against her. They saw her power over the people, her miraculous potions, her intoxicating lusts. They feared Arakali, thought she might threaten their legacy. Yet that's the curious thing about spiders. They only leave their web when you force them to. I be missing me granddaughter something terrible. You know, I used to tell Lily, 
bedtime stories till she fell asleep in me arms. She loved the ones about Kishara, a tough as nails Val Lassie, said to have explored every coast, cove, and bay of this blasted continent with the help of her star. Some nifty artifact she nabbed from somewhere on her first voyage. Young Lily, she were fascinated by Kishara's star. Said to be fair humming with thaumaturgy, able to guide its mistress wherever she be fixing to journey. Methinks me granddaughter liked to imagine that one day she'd hold the star in her hands and explore the outer reaches of this world. Oh, I'd dearly love to see her again. But there ain't no way I'm making that journey with nothing to show for it. She looks up to me, does Lily. So, I'm reckoning that star might put a smile on her pretty face with such a gift in hand. I'd maybe have the guts to go visit my granddaughter instead of skulking here like some craven ghost. That's if some kind and brave soul fetched it for me. Legend has it, Kishara got herself in some hot water with a certain queen at Ziri. Details are vague as to exactly how, but by all accounts, at Ziri weren't the most understanding of lasses. <laughs> Kishara, being the free-spirited sort, probably just pricked the royal ass with some spiky facts from the outside world. Almost lost her head for her trouble, Kishara. That Ziri took a ship and made sacrifices of her crew, forced the poor girl into hiding. Still, Kishara being of a wily inclination like myself, she slipped through at Ziri's talons and right out of the Empire. But before she left, Kishara hid the star somewhere near the causeway that leads into the old Val city up north, just in case she got caught, I suppose. Something like that, in the hands of a tyrant like Adziri. Who knows what trouble she might have found with it. Yes, I know of Grothgol, the grieving mother. She featured quite prominently in some of the vowel texts I restored during my time at the museum in Theopolis. After the deaths of her children, Queen Grothgol fled north, eventually finding respite amongst the refugees of her own shattered realm. Yet these loyalists saw their own queen as a weapon, a tool for vengeance. They nurtured her pain, transfiguring sorrow into hatred Hatred into violence. Like a grizzled bear, Grothkull descended into animalism and ferocity. Yet her caretakers foolishly underestimated the agony their bereaved queen harbored in her heart. Like a bear caught in a trap, Grothkull wrenched free of her human loyalties and slew her followers to the last woman and child. Through devastation, Grothkull ascended to divinity. Grothkull's pain has transcended ages, and she will vent that pain upon any and all she encounters until her grief is finally laid to rest. I was never one for eulogies, and I'm still not. I feel I have failed my poor Groost, not being able to return his bones to the resting place of his people. Still, we have done all we could, considering the circumstances. Groost was a practical man at heart, he would understand. You deserve our thanks. Here are some of Groost's most treasured possessions. I'm sure he would have wanted you to have one.
release you from motherhood's rage. The tragedy is that our world, our kind, may turn something as pure and honorable as a mother's love into such a vicious weapon of wrath and butchery. I only hope that Grathkul will find her children, happy in her arms, in the realms beyond. There's no joy in slaying a mother. Just a hollow victory. You are like the frog that strikes the fly faster than I can see. No. Carry your bright bugs to Arakali's gate. We will meet there and brew our fire dew. Not here. Too much to burn. Too many to make blind. So the grieving mother sleeps once more. Her story has come to fascinate me, and your conquest of her makes for a satisfying dramatic climax, don't you think? I'm but an old man living vicariously through your life. As history seems intent on repeating itself, I should record it in a book. An historical account of the goddess Grothkol and the legendary champion who defeated her. Yes, the title needs a bit of work, but it will suffice for now. Here, consider this offering as an advance on the royalties we shall reap post-publication. That is, if there is anyone in Rayclast who can read. So... This is Kishara's famed star. Ah, just as I reckoned. It won't point me in any one direction. It can't make up its mind. I suspect you to me not being able to make up mine. I feel a tremor of prophecy coming over me, like some scallywags just stomped over my grave. If I go see Lily, there's to be only disappointment and sorrow. And if that's what the future has in store, then it can keep it. I wish a long and vibrant life for the girlie. One free of the trouble that an old dead buccaneer like I might bring upon her. Your soft whispers beneath earth tingle my skin, like breath of laughter against my loins. I sleep not. I hear your name inside my skull. Arakali. No name tasted so sweet on my tongue. Stories I have heard, tales of cursed beauty, visage of woman, jewel that walks the streets in final days of a great empire. Her tell you sought victims, but I know too. You sought man to love you, to break spell. You hoped true love might allow you to shed eight-leg body, to become goddess of love once more. I pledge myself to you, my lady of Val. I promise love, for I am that man you have waited on. Corrupt corpse lovers claim to worship you, call you spinner of shadows. But you have spun only shadows of desire about my heart. Sweet Aragali, I have found your altar. I will speak the call. I will return you to beauty. I will raise you from black pits of despair, and together we shall rule Rayclast in glory forever. Fireflies, so bright and juicy with flame. Now for the right, I warn you. Stand back and be not afraid of what you see. And be not afraid for me. The spirit guides and protects. Though I may change, I shall still be, will always be, Yina. Well, 
they were highly advanced in their technology, the Val were rather brutish in their social practices. I find it rather baffling to think of the Val as a people who believed in science and progress, and yet constructed elaborate sacrificial altars in the centers of their cities. Judging by the construction of this particular ruin, I would say that the city rose to prominence during the reign of Queen Tetzlapoka, who some scholars refer to as a waif of disturbing proclivities. She was a devotee of Arakali, and according to the literature, had a deep fascination with mortality and the inert human form. The histories tell how the queen would request her subjects to deposit the bodies of their deceased loved ones upon the steps of her palace. The corpses would be promptly taken inside to be used for... Unfortunately, most scholars fell into hysterical conjecture at that point. At least I hope it was conjecture. the true climax of perverted lust. Many an artist of Asmerian descent has engaged in the sad worship of that sultry arachnid. But you looked in those hypnotic eyes and then ripped them out. She lies in her bed of sordid memory, alone. A little of the spider yet creeps and crawls in my palm. A touch more power for my subdural of gods? If that was the goddess of lust, then I'm considering an oath of celibacy. You hear that? No. It is spirit singing as does the fly who escapes the web. Yes, it is most happy with us. And with your strange friend there too. He is a god. Yes, I can see that much. But why he helps you? Of all questions, that one you must have answered to. Now I must return to Broken Bridge. So tired now. We will speak more of silk and sorrow then. Many an artist of Asmerian descent has engaged in the sad worship of that sultry... Poor Silk. Like so many before him, Silk succumbed to a most insidious disease. Ambition. That craving for greatness an irresistible compulsion to leave one's mark on the world. There's another name for marks like that. Scars. I miss my friend. Silk knew the spirit as I did. We would talk, understand it, together. Now there is no one but me.